The long-awaited 2020 NBA Draft is finally for the history books, and after following his journey for many years on the channel, it's inspiring to see Lamelo live his NBA dream and finally get drafted. I want to say a major shout out to everyone who joined our watch party last night. We pulled 145,000 viewers on a live stream, which is insane bro. So for any new viewers, on this channel we're going to be covering a wide range of basketball topics. Varying from NBA, high school, G League, Euro League. We're going to do interviews, documentaries, live streams. A whole lot of unique and versatile content is coming to the channel. So if that's of any interest to you guys, click that big red button, subscribe to the channel. Let's try to get 2,000 likes on this in-depth breakdown. Anyways, what we're going to be talking about in today's video is the Rookie of the Year race. And I'm going to explain to you why this award is Lamelo Balls to lose. But like I said, I've covered Melo on this channel for many years. I've watched him play at every level of his career and feel I'm as well positioned as anybody to analyse his game and project how his skills will translate to the NBA level. I'm sure you guys are all well aware by now that with the third pick in last night's draft, the youngest ball brother was selected by the Hornets, who is headed to Charlotte to start his NBA career next season. The Hornets for a very long time now haven't been a good basketball team and last season was no different. Charlotte won just 22 games finishing as the 10th seed, falling 10 games short of the 8th seed. Regardless of whether or not they improve with Lamelo next season, it doesn't matter. Of all the NBA awards, Rookie of the Year puts the least emphasis on winning. We've seen rookies on teams with diabolical records win the award purely because of stats. Let's take a look at Michael Carter-Williams, someone whose numbers in his rookie season in the NBA are almost identical to those of Melo's last year in Australia. Despite shooting 26% from the three-point line leading his team to just 19 wins, Michael Carter-Williams comfortably won Rookie of the Year. So even if you have concerns about Melo's efficiency and percentages, he's gonna be in contention for the award based off of his stats alone. Of the top three picks which were widely considered to be head and shoulders above the rest of their draft class, Melo Ball is in the best position to put up numbers. Anthony Edwards and James Wiseman are gonna be third options on their teams next season, while the Hornets are gonna be Melo's team from the jump. He's the franchise cornerstone and we should expect his usage rate to be the highest among rookies next season. And high usage rate comes packaged with inflated stats. And speaking of inflated stats, Lamelo's NBL stats are actually deflated. And that's because of FIBA international rules. For example, Melo last season averaged 6.8 assists per game. But in Australia, they're a lot stricter about what they credit an assist. One dribble means no assist. So he averaged almost 7 assists per game with 0 dribbles. So how many assists is he going to average in the NBA? where they are ridiculously lenient in what they class as an assist. You'll sometimes see big men credited for assists for inbounding the ball in the backcourt. The stat-friendly rules combined with the NBA shooting and spacing gives me valid reason to expect Lamelo to average between 8 and 9 assists per game next season. As for his shooting, I don't think it's nearly as big a deal as it's being made out to be. I don't like how these mainstream analysts act like they were actually up at 3am watching the Illawarra Hawks play in Wollongong, Australia. They try to evaluate the overseas game as if it's the American game when it's completely different. I heard people saying Lamelo is inefficient for shooting 37% from the field as a rookie. But the three-time NBL league MVP shot 43% from the field. That's just one of many examples why you can't just look at the box score and write off Melo as a shooter. How about another one? Let's put his three-point percentage side by side with Anthony Edwards. Now without context, 29 and 25%, there really isn't much difference. But what they don't tell you is that they shoot from the same distance in the NBL as they do in the NBA. So Edwards is shooting a marginally better percentage from the perimeter from a shorter three-point line against players his age. Lamelo did it against pros, grown men who get paid to play basketball for a living. For every one future NBA player Edwards faced in college, 10 of those will probably never play professional basketball in their life. You can't compare pros to amateurs, it's ridiculous. Yes, statistically 25% from the three point line is horrible, but saying Melo can't shoot because of this one statistic is very misleading. First and foremost, he played just 12 games and started the season off very cold from the perimeter. In his first six games, he went 7 of 39. That 17% that was primarily due to his bad shot selection. He was taking low percentage, off the dribble, step back, pull up threes. And way too many of them. 
However, with a bit of coaching, he was able to make some adjustments and started being smarter with his shot selection, which led to an improved percentage over his next six games of 28%. Yes, this still isn't great, but had his season not been cut short due to injury, I'm sure these percentages would have continued to increase. You also got to remember Lamelo his entire life has been encouraged to shoot as many times as he wants and not worry about the percentages. It's going to take more than 12 games for him to completely iron that out of his system. It also must be noted that he shot 38% on catch and shoot attempts. And that's over the sample size of the entire season. What Melo needs to do is take less of them hardened step back threes and just be smarter with his shot selection. That and less 30 foot pull up threes at the beginning of the shot clock will do wonders for his percentages. Now is he the great shooter we thought he was when we saw clips of him calling out his half court shots at Chino? No. But he's not this terrible shooter these evaluators have portrayed him to be. He shoots with confidence, a little too much at times, but has proven time and time again that he can hit the big shots when it matters most. And in terms of adapting to the NBA game, Lamelo is as well positioned as any prospect in history to come in and make that adjustment because he's arguably the most experienced prospect of all time. Yes, there has been players that have played at higher levels and accomplished more, but can you name me another NBA player that has played in three different continents in their pre-NBA career? A lot of these other guys have been the guy their entire lives. They don't know any different of being the star. So what happens is they get to the NBA, all of a sudden they're a rookie, they get hit with a reality check that they're a role player, and then they get humbled. Lamelo already had that humbling when he went to Lithuania as a teenager. He was the biggest child star in all of America and was struggling sitting on the bench in a mediocre league in Eastern Europe. People want to talk about the move to Lithuania as a failure but I'd argue otherwise. Do you not think in the long run it will have done Melo better to have had that experience rather than having spent a junior year jacking up as many shots as he wanted in high school? I believe his experience in Lithuania mentally prepared him for his experience in Australia. Compare his situation to RJ Hampton who hadn't had that experience of playing pro before going to the NBL. Who when joining the New Zealand Breakers was considered a top 5 prospect in his draft class. He spent the majority of his time on the bench and took some time to adjust to playing against grown men. Whereas Lamelo hit the ground running right away. In his first preseason game had a near quadruple double against Australia's 6 time defensive player of the year. Even in Lavar's JBA league, he experienced what it's like to be the man and had the freedom to do whatever he pleased. Playing with that security of being able to do whatever he wanted was what probably made him so comfortable trying new things and being creative. Then again on the JBA USA tour, Melo gained more experience against pros. He has the experience of playing with and against the Europeans who play the European way, with and against players that play the Australian way, and with and against players that play the American way. All of this is subconsciously ingrained in his makeup and basketball DNA. I also think it's comical to call him a loser or question the competition he's faced. Because when in high school playing people his age, he starred on the best team in the nation at Chino Hills and on the prep scene at Spire was tournament MVP of the grind session, who have one of the toughest schedules in the country. He lost no more than 6 games in his high school career. So what we're doing now is comparing what Melo did against pros to what other players did against kids. Why do we ask these questions of Lamelo? hold it against him for failing to lead his bad teams to wins in pro leagues? But you never hear anyone say the same for Wiseman. What competition did he face in his three games of college basketball? I don't hear people saying the same thing about Anthony Edwards whose team weren't on pace to make the NCAA tournament. Nobody expects a top draft pick to come into the NBA and lead a lottery team to the playoffs. So you can't expect a top prospect coming out of high school to go over to Australia's NBL, join a bad team and lead them to the playoffs either. I'm just trying to expose the hypocrisy within the media and prove to you guys that Lamelo has been held to a higher standard than any prospect in the draft. As for the defensive end, another major concern, I think the scouts have got it wrong again. Because remember they said the same thing about Lonzo coming into the league, who now is arguably one of the best on-ball guard defenders in the league. I think Lamelo is going to be the exact same, because while he has no defensive IQ, he doesn't understand schemes and common basketball terminology, his defensive instincts are top tier. I think him playing that run and gun full court press Chino Hill style has given him an elite understanding of timing and when to intercept. You always see him grabbing steals in the backcourt, anticipating passing lanes, he has the height and lateral movement to be just like his brother on the defensive end, 
He's got quick hands and he'll be even better on that side of the floor when his body fills out and gets stronger. Yes, the basic understanding isn't yet there, but that's something he can learn and will pick up on very quickly once in the NBA. With Lamelo, I feel people focus too much on the stuff he doesn't do well rather than appreciate his generational gifts. He is a legit 6 foot 7 point guard who is completely ambidextrous, truly a generational passer who sees things on the floor others simply don't. His playmaking in the pick and roll is already world class. His handle is already elite and he has a layup package that allows him to finish well at the basket. His floater range extends all the way out to the 3 point line and there is simply no ceiling as to how good he can become on the offensive side of the floor. I would describe him as a pass first player with a score first mentality. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise, Mellow Ball is a scorer. I've seen him effortlessly drop 40 point triple doubles live in person against credible pro teams. Claims about his motor, his drive, his love for the game and work ethic is outdated. These are old narratives from when he was a teenager. I've interviewed his trainer on the channel, Mellow has been grinding in the off season and has been ever since returning to the states to join Spire in 2018. He wants to be a hall of famer, he wants to be great and he is prepared to put in the work necessary to do what he has to do to make the most of his talent. Being with the Charlotte Hornets, he is already, even before his NBA debut, the franchise cornerstone. Michael Jordan has drafted him to lead this team, and I think he's going to hit the ground running right out the gate. The Charlotte Hornets could surprise a lot of people next season. They are definitely among the winners of the 2020 NBA draft. Drafting Lamelo at number 3 is a massive win, but I also love the Vernon Carey pick in the second round. That's a steal for someone who was ranked the 6th best player in this recruiting class a year ago coming into Duke. They also managed to pick up Grant Ryler at 56, NBA ready, all conference player in college who averaged 21 points per game his senior year. Let's show some love to Devontae Graham, who had a breakout year last season averaging almost 20 a game. Terry Rozier is an asset and player of some value as well, who put up nearly 20 a game. Another two players that are worth mentioning, last year's lottery pick Miles Bridges, who's a solid young player, as well as PJ Washington, both former McDonald's All-Americans who've had bright starts to their careers in Charlotte. If Mitch Kupchak can make some moves, I seriously think the Charlotte Hornets can make a run at the 8th seed in the Eastern Conference. They weren't too far removed to begin with and I wholeheartedly believe Lamelo is going to make them that much better. But yeah guys, that is my breakdown, my insight and my opinion on Lamelo Ball to the Charlotte Hornets. I believe he's going to win Rookie of the Year for the reasons I've just spent breaking down this video. Let me know what you think of the new style of videos. I told you guys I was going to make more versatile, different type of videos. This is just an experiment right here. If you did enjoy, make sure to leave a like on the video. If new around here and made it up to this point, hopefully you've stuck around because you've enjoyed what you're hearing and want to subscribe to the channel. If so, hit that big red button, turn on notifications. Links to my Discord server, Twitter and Instagram are down below in the description. And on that note, it's DKM signing out. Till next time and peace.